well, or it, it's, what's going to happen is you're probably going to find that there are some things that don't work for specific uh, instances uh, in, in the budget. We have to make sure it's well um, considered before it goes on the ballot and statutory limit helps us do that. Yeah, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we reiterate that we're not inventing a spending cap in Alaska law. We are revising a spending cap in Alaska law. Today in existence is a statutory and constitutional spending limit. But we know that those curbs were um, inadequate, right? So um, the, the uh, based on population and some sort of escalator um, has not worked for us. I don't know what it would have taken to crash through it, but they tried really hard and still were unable to do so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so we're just evaluating on a, a more realistic um, curve, if you will, of growth. And I think, again, it's that same we see. When we're asking people now to invest through a POMV or other revenues that we're ensuring them that we're not going to use those dollars to dramatically grow government. It's for a, an acceptable level or curve um, much like the curve that we've had in growth with the exception of those incredible huge years of capital and operational spending that we began correcting in 2013. Matt? Um, and then Matt, who is with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, I asked a question, I asked a version of this question last week, but I wanted to reframe it and maybe broaden it. Um, I'm just wondering from the Senate's perspective what the likelihood is um, that there will be some cut uh, of, of any kind to education, whether that's formula or non-formula, um, and, and if you got from the Senate, and if you guys can speak to that. Um, the specific cuts that are going to happen, uh, Matt, this isn't just giving me a stiff arm here on this question. Um, that's going to develop through, this, through the process of finance, and I would much prefer that the finance people dig in on that, particularly the, the co-chairs. Um, the Senate has not been shy about reforming education and making some cuts to education. We've said that nothing is beyond scrutiny as far as uh, the, the, the state budget. Uh, the, state, the Senate has gone down that path before regarding education um, and others, you know, it takes, uh, takes three in this building, actually four, <laughs> um, uh, to get something done on the budget. So um, let's let the finance people develop their plan and, and maybe answer that question a little more fully to you. And uh, they, as we did last year, uh, have periodic uh, press conferences. Of course, you have access to them in, uh, in the building. So I would just say well, let's, let's, let's let finance determine that over the next few months. Is it fair to say that at least right now, sort of big picture, that that is an, an area where you know, you guys expect to have to at least focus on for reduction. It's fair to say education is not beyond scrutiny uh, in this process. Um, Steve. Uh, good morning, Steve Quinn with Bloomberg. Um, so, at, at the end of 90 days, what are you uh, what are you looking at? Do you, do you think you're going to get out of here and still have savings um, in the CBR, or are you going to have another sizable draw that leaves? virtually nothing left. Well, there will be a sizable draw. There may almost no way around that in, in this particular session. But if we leave here, we should have in place, if we'll follow the Senate's plan, we should have in place a budgetary regime that actually takes us well into the future and actually fixes our, our fiscal problem. James? James Brooks from the Juno Empire. Senator Machiki, uh, what's the status of Title IV reforms? When can we expect to see those? The uh, status right now is we are a, um, Friday was the last day for comments from the stakeholder group. As you know, there are 80-something different groups represented on that team. Um, we have the last um, comments in place. We have a meeting this week to review those comments with the overall team and then we will send the final bill for drafting, which I, I have to say it's about 95 percent there. At this point, all the stakeholder teams, all the stakeholder members are on board um, and we've gotten to some minor drafting issues and such. So I believe you'll see a bill next week um, that will drop with a number and uh, something to focus on as we move it through this session. To follow up, is this, in terms of the complexity of this bill, this is going to be less so than criminal justice reforms, but still fairly large? 
it's a Title IV rewrite. It's a 100-page bill. Um, the impacts to the general public are not, um, it couldn't be compared to that of uh, Senate Bill 91 or 74 type thing. It's, it's largely sort of confined to the alcohol statutes. Um, but it's a significant bill and will take some time to process. Whether or not it can get through this year as opposed to the second half of the session is yet to be seen. But the fact that we've kept all of the stakeholder members on board and in support of the bill is, is uh, obviously going to be a, a huge plus in moving the bill forward. Liz, back to you. Uh, we've got some hearings coming up uh, today and later this week uh, regarding the privatization of uh, API and Alaska Pioneer Homes. Is that a priority for the Senate? That was part of uh, SB 74, and there were feasibility reports that were due on that. I they're here. I haven't read them yet. Uh, I know the recommendation probably isn't for full privatization. It's important in that it works uh, with 74 for the overall reform of Medicaid and uh, and health care in Alaska. Um, but um, uh, I haven't read through that report yet. But I don't think the report says full-on privatization is uh, necessarily the path that they recommend at this time. That's an unfortunate thing, too, because it, it makes, you know, government shouldn't act quickly. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we shouldn't just be whimsical and going back and forth on uh, different approaches to things. But um, privatization has been something that the people of Alaska have asked for time and time again. It's been difficult to achieve because you do have that feasibility study always in the way. If you say we need privatization today, you've got a year, a year and a half to go through uh, before you can implement the uh, re results of a feasibility study. It's just a barrier. So mm -hmm. just, it is the kind of outside of the, and I almost outside of the, saying outside of the box, because it's said so commonly, it's almost become inside of the box. I hate using that term, but I don't have a better one, right? <laughs> but the, I mean, it's, it's much like the consolidation of A to AEA and AHFC, right? If we are going to um, significantly reduce the cost of this government without dramatically impacting constitutionally required services, we are going to have to look at those um, suggestions, if you will, and process them through until we decide if it's best. Privatization works in some departments doesn't work in others, but it's certainly worth the effort. It's an important part of, of us um, changing the way we deliver government. Right. Other questions? James? James Brooks, again from the Juno Empire. I wanted to follow up on something Steve had asked you about. Your goal has always been to stick to the 90-day session, but is it fair to say, to say that even though you'd like to stick to 90 days, we're probably going to be here longer than that. Well, actually, to say it's a goal to be at the 90 days, it's really not a goal. Um, that's a, uh, a strong preference. But the fact is, is we're here to do a job, and we have to get the job done right. Uh, we, we're not here to be in a 90-day session. We're here to fix some of the problems. Go ahead, Matt. Um, I was wondering if, uh, Matt Hurst with Alaska Dispatches, I was wondering if either of you guys heard or heard about uh, the testimony in House Resources on Friday from Robin Brenna, and if so, what you guys thought. Well, I think he said one thing that I thought was kind of absurd, and that is he said a reasonable person would never vote for uh, SB 21. Um, SB 21 is probably responsible for the uh, uh, the increase in production that we have. Essentially, it's working pretty well right now. That doesn't mean that there aren't things that we can look at from time to time, but uh, SB 21 produces a higher income during these, this period of low prices than we ever would have gotten uh, with the alternative. The other thing is that SB 21 got rid of most of the tax credits and put them on a downward uh, trajectory rather than a continuing upward trajectory. Uh, ACES, the, the, the uh, tax regime that we replace with SB 21, um, is going to save the state amazing amounts of money and make the state more money. Uh, I don't know why a reasonable person wouldn't be in favor of that. Um, Mr. President, I also think uh, the ordinary um, Alaskans like ourselves that voted in favor of uh, no on one, which is the majority of Alaskans, could find that somewhat as an offensive statement. Um, I, I find the people that vote in Alaska to be very reasonable, and they supported Senate Bill 21 going forward. So I, I think that's an interesting way to approach um, a disagreement with a bill, and you can disagree with certain philosophies about the bill, 
many of them um, that we also agree could use some adjustment. We repaired last year in HB 247. So if you want to take a snapshot in time and you philosophically did not agree with something and leave all the facts going forward out of it, I th it might be a, um, a statement one is comfortable making. I, I, um, I think if you actually sat back and, and processed all of the information that occurred, not in the, only in the development of the bill, but the support of Alaskans and the results we've seen in production, um, it's an interest, it is an interesting statement. Much of the debate over SB 21, uh, the, the other side, when I say the other side, meaning probably the other side from Senator Machicki and myself, uh, it's, been, it's like it's coming from bizarro world. Uh, they say that the credits are a problem, yet ACES uh, was a huge problem with credits, and SB 21 went a long way to fixing uh, credits. There may be some other work that we have to do on that, but certainly the SB 21 credits regime is far preferable to the ACES re regime. Uh, they said it would uh, break the state because it would give us less money. That's just the opposite of what is true. There's a political element to the discussion on SB 21 that can't be denied, and I'll look specifically Rob and Brenna. Um, he's a citizen of Alaska, so he has every right to testify, no question about it. But to be highlighted, Rob and Brenna is not an expert, and Rob and Brenna has emerged as someone who was standing in a, in a uh, resource committee hearing that went on as long as it did. Uh, he has standing because he's become remarkably political over the last few years. Remember the commercials that you heard? that were uh, tearing down some pretty good people in the state were sponsored by Robert Brennan. So he has a political agenda that I'm not exactly sure what it is, um, but his uh, comments on SB 21 that he's been asked to, uh, to step out and uh, somehow be an expert on, uh, they're, they're, they're exactly opposite of what the, what the truth is. Do you have an, an idea of who might have served as a better sort of, you know, if they're hearing from oil, oil industry on, on Wednesday, you know, who in your mind would have been a better I don't know, Matt, if you were to pick somebody off the street, I'm not sure you would uh, pick someone who so identified himself as a uh, political agent uh, rather than an expert on oil and gas. Go. Oh, who, who do we have online? Katie Quinn. Oh, Katie Quinn, go ahead. She needs news? Oh. Good morning, gentlemen. I was just wondering about uh, Senator Wilikowski's proposal to freeze per diem payments at the 90-day mark of the session. How do you feel about that? I haven't given it that much thought. Uh, if people are working and they're uh, caught here in Juneau and they have rent to pay and and uh, food to buy at restaurants and those kinds of things, we're probably going to pay them per diem. We're not going to uh, uh, go, go overboard and pay people per diem who are uh, going back to their districts and living there. I mean, if you have to travel back and forth, that's one thing. Keep in mind, too, some people that go home at the end of session and, and are still uh, involved in the session, uh, they're, they're renting a place down here, and they've got big payments to make. So, um, you know, Katie, I, I, I don't know that we've ever met, but you, you've probably heard me say this before, and that is, this is the people's branch of government. And yet, every time we turn around, uh, someone wants to restrict the people's branch more and more and more. Uh, our founding fathers didn't see it that way. They were uh, they were afraid of the expansion of the power of the, of the king or the executive in our case, and uh, they held the people's branch a little more sacred. Over time, though, uh, it, we, the people's branch has become a pretty a particularly pesky branch of government uh, for those who want to engage in pretty sweeping change that I don't think is very good for this country. So I am going to stand for the people's branch. It doesn't mean I'm going to throw around a bunch of money when it doesn't need to be thrown around, but I'm not uh, just out there fighting, dying to find ways to fully restrict the people's branch. Can I go ahead and throw a little something to that, Mr. President? And however, if I can throw a however in there, <coughs> we have put pressure on the Senate majority to not only observe the 90 days, although we're not in full control, if you remember last year, I mean, we're, we're working hard and very aggressively on the schedule. We would like to be out of here in 90 days, so we are also putting pressure on our members to reduce their costs wherever possible. We think we need to lead the way in um, reducing spending. So. Although we, we agree that uh, anything after 90 um, perhaps looks bad to the Alaskan people, the reality of it is we're going to have some costs, but we're going to keep that pressure on our members to um, not take advantage of the um, benefits that are available to us and uh, 
please send that message also to the House. We, we believe that we should be out of here in 90 days. We think the choices are limited, and the key legislation that has to pass is, uh, in my view, down to three pieces of legislation that has to pass this year, and that those negotiations should not take um, more than 90 days. So in, in some ways, we agree with that schedule, and others, when it's beyond our control that that the getting out of here this year takes more than 90 days. It shouldn't come out of the pockets of those that are ready to act sooner but forced to stay longer. And that's, and that's a good point, Senator Machicki. Uh, last year is a really good example. The Senate was done. Uh, we had some pretty reasonable pr uh, proposal in place. And um, then the uh, shenanigans that happened in the in the special session dragged us on and on and on and people were uh, essentially people were given too many things to say no to and I had warned the governor and the other side we need to, to narrow this discussion to a few things that we can agree on and yet we had a multitude of bills to to discuss there's never a formula for getting through a special session quickly you need to narrow the narrow the discussion as best you can and uh, the hard work that the senate went through and everyone does everybody works hard in this building but the the hard work the senate went due to get a bill done early quite early so that we clear the decks to discuss the larger fiscal uh, problem uh, that wasn't just an accident that we got done that early last year with our budget. We did it specifically so that we could get on with the discussion of a, uh, a fiscal plan, uh, and we needed to free up drafters, we needed to free up meeting space, we needed to free up staff <coughs> to more adequately discuss those things, and the House just kind of caved in on itself. Uh, last question, Andrew. And you know what, I actually want to go one more to Steve after Andrew, because he, he, I kind of passed over Steve. Go ahead, Andrew. So uh, you had said that uh, the state should have a, a budgetary regime that, that uh, fi fixes the fiscal problem mm -hmm. at the end of the session. Uh, the governor's budget starts off with a $2.7 billion deficit. Right. Is there a number of a draw that you would say would be too large as far as savings, whether it's CBR or the earnings reserve? Uh, that would be too large and wouldn't actually fix fix the problem. Where you would consider that the legislature or the state didn't fix the problem this session. Well, uh, if the size of the draw you, of, for this year is the measure, then you're kind of limiting yourself. You need to make sure that what you have in place is a is a workable plan going into the future. Uh, we may have to just kind of uh, wince and, um, and and move on, if depending on how large the the draw is this year. But that's not the goal. Is necessarily this year's draw. It's for for future draws and how our uh, spending looks in the future. Uh, Sam, check in on that. No, I, I mean, I just, when I talk about the key legislation that has to pass, I mean, keep in mind, none of us <coughs> expected, I, I ran for the first time and came into office four years ago, I can tell you that I never thought I might be involved in restructuring of the permanent fund. I mean, it wasn't one of those send me in coach, right, <laughs> um, things, but unfortunately our choices are limited when you have that size of a gap. But with the restructuring and um, some reductions, we know that we have a very manageable gap and we have savings that moves 15 years out versus one um, before we're in a critical uh, juncture of this state state uh, history, if you will, budget history. So uh, when we think about the remaining draw, I mean, if we if we do the necessary things we need to do and we walk out of here with an eight hundred million dollar gap, then we have something to come back and talk about next year. If we complicate the solutions of a restructuring and a reasonable budget this year with all of those other philosophical rhetorical things. That's when it gets really complicated, and that's what drags on through the years. So um, if we can isolate it to those issues and sort of agree to come back and talk about the other philosophical things that close the remainder of the gap, the people of Alaska win. If we complicate it and drag on through the summer, I think we all lose. Yeah. Uh, last question, Steve. And before you ask it, I just want to make a comment to uh, Nat. You had a, a story on the, the travel. And, what, and just, and I think you mentioned that the travel has been cut by the Senate. Uh, what was it? We went from 1.1 million in the, in the, uh, yeah, we've gone from 1.1 million down to 300,000 in the Senate. So there's been, yeah, there's been some serious management uh, by the Senate regarding our travel. Uh, go ahead. I'm getting back to your three points. When do you think we'll see some, uh, I used this term last week, modeling 
I think your response was, uh, mm -hmm. you don't want us to see, get a dog and pony show, but sure. just to say, when will we see some numbers? Yeah. You know, um, Steve, the, the modeling that we had last year um, regarding SB 128 was pretty close to what you'd see this year. But again, I, I'm, I try to be as respectful of the, the, the chairman as possible, and the, uh, the Senate Finance Chairs will, will decide when that comes out. There is modeling being done, and I would say that it's going to look something very similar to what you saw last year. So, everybody, appreciate everybody being here. We'll see you next week.